The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Business Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to the Global Business with Mahesh Joshi. In this episode, we are going to discuss the most important piece of global business, financing. How does the global financing impact global business across multiple borders? Today, we have with us a very distinguished global personality, Professor Mark Bertonish. Mark is a visiting professor of finance at Harvard Business School. He is a three-year, three-time winner of the prestigious Harvard Business School's Faculty Award. Professor Bertanish also has been a regular faculty member in finance at the University of Oxford, Said Business School, and a visiting professor at HEC Paris, INSEAD, and ESC Bordeaux. <clears throat> professor Bertanish is a director at several companies, including Sun Hydraulics and Total Infrastructures, Gaz France. He's also the author or co-authors on six books, two videos, and more than 50 published articles on various financial topics. Welcome, Professor Bertanesh. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you, Mahesh. Okay, Mark, the rise of global financial markets have brought both wealth and risk to almost every part of the world. In 21st century, what is the role of financing in global business in your view? As you know, uh, finance, if you look at history, has always been global. I mean, it is not something new if you look at history. But today, uh, because of uh, uh, globalization of uh, companies and globalization of the, of the economy, uh, finance has become more and more uh, global. I think the role of uh, finance is really to help companies finding the right financing at the right time uh, with the right characteristics to finance their growth. Uh, the, the role of finance is always essential because, uh, as we say sometimes, I mean, uh, money is like blood in the body. If you have no blood, I mean, you are dead. So uh, uh, we need to get the blood. I think uh, companies are realizing now that because of the global uh, world that we are in, we can finance ourselves almost everywhere in the world, uh, try to find money where it is good to find it, where it is interesting to, good it, to, to get it, and um, uh, uh, finance is really helping uh, the uh, world to become more and more global. Do you think the financial architecture and the infrastructure available adequate to support global business and trade? I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think if you look at technology, my answer will be yes. I mean, today we have the technology to really support global business, global trade, uh, uh, and, and global financing. Uh, if we look at the more, uh, I would say, uh, institutional, legal, and uh, uh, probably day-to-day uh, um, -day, uh, type of issue, it is, it is, it is probably less true. Uh, uh, markets need probably uh, to be more uh, organized in some places. Uh, pro probably needs to be better regulated in some other place. Uh, as you know, finance without regulation is jungle, and we don't want jungle. So uh, 
today uh, developing uh, a better uh, regulation uh, by people who understand markets and not by uh, politicians sometimes who don't understand how markets are working. Uh, and uh, developing more efficient market uh, 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 is, is essential. But from a technological viewpoint, we see that uh, you see this uh, high speed trading, I mean, which is, uh, which is so, so, so fast. You see all the platform and the economy uh, in the economy that we have today. I think the, um, the technology is, is there and helping global financing, but probably the, the legal aspect and the in institutional aspect should, should follow. Uh, you know, Mark, there has been a lot of talk about quantitative easing and uh, deficit financing by governments. How does it impact the whole global financing mechanism? And what's the impact of it? You know, you know quantitative easing, uh, which is a very interesting word, it's a technical word to say that uh, we are producing more money, uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, a phenomena which um, uh, has been... Uh, uh, putting money all over the world, in the US first, in Japan, in Europe, in the UK, everywhere. And uh, from a company viewpoint, it looks like it is a good thing because if you apply the uh, law of supply and demand, a lot of supply of money means that the money will be cheaper. And we see that with interest rates being negative in most uh, places in most countries. But uh, negative interest rates, which from an economic viewpoint are something which is a little bit strange to understand, uh, has some negative impact. You know, money is a commodity, and like any commodity, uh, it has to have a reasonable price. If a commodity is too cheap, there is a tendency to waste it, to misuse it, and it's probably what's going to happen today. Uh, the second problem with this uh, quantitative easing and this huge amount of money uh, in the economy um, is that it is um, uh, postponing the important structural reforms that countries should do. Why should we, uh, if I'm a government, why should I try to reduce my deficit if I can finance myself at negative interest rate? Uh, why uh, should I uh, uh, do some efforts when things are so easy because of the what is in? So I think the monetary policy of some countries, uh, the the big countries in the world, have reached some limits now. And uh, uh, we are in a situation where uh, uh, this huge amount of money is uh, uh, not uh, uh, getting uh, some good result. And in particular, because interest rates are either zero or negative, it means that investors are going to try to find a way of getting better return. And to do so, they are going to take sometimes huge risk. And therefore, uh, 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 this is leading also to some uh, risk-taking position in, in the economy. Uh, we are talking about this amount of money. I mean, sometimes we don't realize the size of the market. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, ju just a quick figure. I don't want to give too many figures. But uh, when you realize that the daily transaction on the foreign exchange market, every day on the exchange rate market, there is something like 5.4 trillion US dollars. That's Five, a big number. It's a big number. Yeah. Right? 5,400,000 yeah. billion dollars. I mean, wow. it's a huge number per day. Yeah. So try to see how much it is at the end of the day. So uh, uh, this, uh, this money being flooding a little bit everywhere in the economy is apparently good news for uh, the company who are looking for financing because the cost of money is going down, but it is um, hiding a lot of potential problems and uh, postponing uh, the uh, solution to some structural problem in some countries. It looks like uh, there's, there's a huge role in global business. The number you gave, Mark, $5.4 trillion, that shows how much is a global business happening. That's why you need foreign exchange. Uh, <clears throat> Moving on, Mark, what are your views on how has financing changed from industrial era to the digital era, which we see now? I think we are, we, we are experiencing a, a huge change in the world today. I mean, uh, um, if uh, uh, we go from this industrial era to this so-called digital era, just to, uh, to, to mention a few on fintech, 
Uh, the fintech are this company which are uh, using uh, technologies and sophisticated technology to provide financial service. And, and, and one of the questions that they are raising is, are banks going to be around in the near future? I mean, they are competitive, competitors to the banks. Uh, and and it is um, uh, if you look at some other way of financing, something which is uh, today well known, the crowd funding, uh, which mm-hmm. uh, uh, directly uh, uh, make companies in need of financing to the people who are uh, ready to uh, uh, finance these companies without intermediaries, is uh, is another example of big change. Um, uh, the, the financing of startup, you know, where uh, you have all this uh, seed money. To finance new business, right, uh, and uh, and uh, also all the new ways of of payments. You know, you have heard about this uh, Bitcoin and this so-called uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, which are ways of developing uh, new uh, currencies, which have the advantages of uh, uh, making transactions faster, cheaper, but at the same times are uh, creating a lot of issues. Uh, like, uh, are they uh, the mean to uh, recycle uh, some uh, dirty money? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, are they the way to help uh, some uh, uh, dark transactions? So there, there, there are issues, but at the same time, uh, I mean, if we, if we talk about the Bitcoin, because I was talking about it, uh, we know that the, te- the te- technology is uh, developing new things. In the Bitcoin itself, uh, I have a lot of doubt on the future of Bitcoin, but uh, the blockchain, which is all this uh, uh, way of recording transaction, is probably one of the big breakthrough of, of the next future, uh, future years, not only in finance, but in business in, in general. One of the things which is changing today also in the financing, when you compare industrial era, in the industrial era, what do you have in your balance sheet? You have tangible, solid assets right. on which you can base some financing. If you have a bank, you look at all this machine, mm-hmm. uh, this plant, uh, this land, and um, this is uh, one way of looking at things. Today, what are companies? They are more knowledge company, intangible company with intangible assets, you know, knowledge, people, expertise, and for for, 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 for financing, for financing this company, for the financial market, it's much more difficult to assess you're right these, because these, these, these companies. You're absolutely right. Uh, our Silicon Valley in U.S. has more than 20,000 startup companies. These are mostly in digital era, the knowledge-based industry. Similarly, in, in India, where the Silicon, the second Silicon Valley is coming in in Bangalore, yeah. if you see the total number of startups have crossed almost 3,000. Yes. So exactly to your point, there's no, you won't see any brick and mortar, but there's a lot of uh, knowledge on which they are getting the financing done. Yeah, it's true. And, and you know, if you are a traditional financial analyst, you're a traditional banker, a traditional finance person, where you have been used to look at companies on their uh, assets, solid assets, tangible assets, right. you are a little bit in a different world when you look at the world of companies today with no assets, you know, no uh, at least no asset in the balance sheet, uh, no tangible things, knowledge, and uh, and therefore the financing is 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 very different. And if you are a bank or if you are a lender, on what do you base uh, this um, your your lending? Not on the value of the assets, tangible asset, but on your belief in uh, the intangible, whether they are a people, whether they are a brand, whether they are a, a, an expectation of the market or whatever. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, This has been brilliant and you uh, highlighted a lot of very valid points that how financing is so important, quantitative easing and uh, shift of uh, financing mechanism from industrial era to digital era. We'll take a short break. Uh, We are here with Professor Mark Bertanesh on Global Business with Mahesh Joshi. We'll be back shortly. Get the news on our shows and other happenings by following us on Twitter. Find us at Voice America TRN or twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN.
out what's happening on the Voice America Talk Radio Network by keeping up with us on Twitter. You can find us at Voice America TRN. back. You are listening to Global Business with Mahesh Joshi, and we have with us Professor Mark Madonish. We are discussing about the impact of global financing on global business. Mark, do you see any interdependence of global business making global financial markets volatile? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, uh, as, as long as markets are not isolated anymore, what happened in one place has an impact on the other place very, very quickly. So the fact that uh, the uh, markets, the business are interdependent uh, makes uh, the market potentially uh, more volatile. And what happened somewhere in uh, China will have an impact in the US or something happening in uh, India might have an impact in London very quickly. So the interdependency is, is, is obvious and it is an, an impact on the global markets. And what we see also, of course, is a progressive shifting of the gravity, the center of gravity of the economic power from Europe and the US towards Asia. Uh, we see um, the development of uh, big organized financial markets, uh, in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Delhi, uh, etc. And um, we see also that what's happening in the world, what we call sometimes the geopolitics, is becoming of crucial importance for financial markets. Uh, I think today uh, finance without an understanding of geopolitics has no value. I mean, if you are an investor, right. if you are a, a corporate finance manager, if you are in the financial world in uh, any case, you have to worry about and to understand about geopolitics. Uh, you see, we see example every day. Look at Russia. Uh, Russia and, uh, and the sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, the sanctions are obviously uh, uh, being of a big uh, uh, problem for, 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 for Russia, which is uh, what the country we are looking for, but at the same time, it has an impact on the economy of uh, the countries who are doing business with, uh, with uh, Russia, and, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, we see how uh, uh, something which uh, 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 is uh, um, desired from a political viewpoint have an impact on the economic uh, uh, um, parameters. Uh, look at the Middle East and the instability of the Middle East, which is creating at the present time a lot of issues, a lot of problems. Uh, right. We're not going to talk about all this problem of the immigration that we have in, uh, in Europe and in some other part of the world, but it's creating also a lot of potential volatilities on the visual market. Look at uh, what's happening in Iran, uh, you know, not too long ago uh, when uh, um, uh, it was something completely uh, prohibited in the US to have been to right. Iran, and uh, if you read the, the newspaper today, uh, Boeing uh, is going to sell 100 uh, uh, big planes to, uh, to Iran, so things are changing very fast. But was uh, something prohibited a, a, a few uh, months ago or a few weeks ago? Uh, remember that uh, one French bank was uh, highly penalized for having done, done business with Iran? Today right. is, is a lot. So things are changing very fast, and you have to become an expert in geopolitics if you want to do good finance. And things are changing also. When we talk about the center of gravity, which is changing, uh, look at the Chinese currency. Chinese currency today is becoming one of the key currency in the world. It's going to be part of the uh, uh, IMF uh, special drawing rights. So uh, it has a status now of a, a quasi international currency. Uh, it is not obviously competing uh, uh, the US dollar uh, or even the euro, but uh, I mean, in the future, we can expect some big change here. So I'm, I'm, I don't know if I've been clear, uh, Mahesh, but uh, uh, I think that um, 
global business uh, is great, uh, but global business means that all the economies are connected to each other, that the markets are connected to each other, and what's happened in one market have an impact very quickly to uh, the other market. The I, transmission are yeah. very, very quick. I think you bring in very good points about geopolitics and shifting economic center of gravity. Like even on the sanctions when we had on Iran, one of the tools was SWIFT. The, the financing activity is the way they control the transfer of money in exactly. and out of Iran. Exactly. So it looks like in terms of uh, the balance of power, uh, also on the geolo- geopolitics side, side, financing is being used also as a, a possible weapon because global business has kind of shattered all the borders. People can uh, trade across the borders and financing is happening. Money is moving across the borders. So that system can be used to regulate the system, the market, also to put some control mechanism. Now, uh, beyond that, there has been a trend in in past few years. Earlier, most of the developed nations were making uh, acquisitions in emerging countries. And now you see a lot of reverse activities uh, in uh, China, India, Korea. A lot of those companies are coming uh, into the developed countries for m and A's, a lot of cross-border m and A's happening. What are your thoughts about uh, the impact of those activities, or rather, the impact of financing mechanism on those activities? Well, oh, that's a, that's a very good point. And what you mentioned as a kind of reverse trend is, is very true. Now you see a, a, a lot of uh, uh, Chinese investors trying to invest in uh, in Europe or even in the States or Indian investors. I mean, uh, uh, when you look at uh, uh, the Tata Group in India, which has become so international, uh, when you look at uh, uh, one of the uh, symbol of the French way of life, uh, Club Med is now owned partially by uh, Chinese money. Uh, uh, Peugeot, uh, which is a French car company, uh, has a strong investor, which is a Chinese investor. So you see a lot of investment across border uh, 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 participation, even sometimes uh, uh, acquisition, and and I think it's a it's it's a it's a good movement, a good trend. Uh, the the implication for uh, businesses in our countries, let's say our so-called developed countries, is that it is leading to, or it is pushing our companies to much more discipline, much more performance. If you are not performing, uh, if you're uh, 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 stock price, if your credit company is going down because your performance are lousy, uh, the risk that uh, uh, an investor or a buyer is, co- is going to come from all over the world, wherever you can imagine from, uh, is, is, is high. So, I mean, this uh, M&A movement is, uh, is developing cross-border and we have a, a lot of examples. You have also to add to that uh, probably the role of the sovereign funds, which are full of money. I mean, uh, when you look at Saudi Arabia, uh, several trillions of dollars. When you look at Norway uh, with the oil money, when you look at Qatar, when you look at Abu Dhabi, uh, these uh, sovereign funds, Singapore, uh, have huge amount of money and they can invest uh, uh, this money in uh, uh, companies uh, buying shares at a minority or even a majority interest uh, 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 share in, in companies. So uh, this uh, interdependency and the fact that uh, the developing countries, as we are calling them, are becoming uh, more and more uh, uh, full of resources and, 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 and able to uh, have a, a purchasing power, uh, which is high, is making this uh, uh, acquisition, uh, investment, uh, uh, merger, uh, more likely to happen in the future. Perfect. And, uh, you know, definitely there is a lot of interdependence, it appears. And uh, what are your views on, uh, Mark, we hear a lot about companies, corporations moving to tax havens or the countries where there are low taxes on them. What do you think about it? I, th- I think we have to be uh, uh, honest here and to uh, uh, start or, or to finish being uh, or finish this hypocrisy that you have in that. I think government all over the world are competing on taxes. Ah, okay. And therefore, I don't see why companies 
should not use this potential advantage. We tend to blame companies for saying, look at this company, they are not paying the high tax they should pay, they are mm-hmm. paying less. But at the same time, let's be frank. When, when I see in Europe, Highland having a corporate tax rate of, I don't remember the exact figure, but 6 or 7%, why it is 30% or more in some other countries in Europe, if I am the uh, uh, CFO of this company or the CEO of this company, uh, and I don't try to do something to minimize the tax impact legally, legally, of course, I'm not talking about tax fraud, I'm talking about tax right. management, uh, uh, my, my board might uh, say you're not doing your job and, uh, and, and fire me. So uh, I think we have to be very clear on that uh, and stop confusing tax fraud and tax optimization. Tax fraud is bad and should be and should be uh, uh, condemned and, 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 and no doubt about that. Tax optimization is what? It's using what the government are offering and proposing mm-hmm. all over the world. And these government are, as I said earlier, competing on taxes. Come to me, come to my place, you'll pay less taxes. Mm-hmm. And then everybody's surprised that the companies are answering, yes, we go to your place because we pay less taxes. Uh, it's it's a very touchy topic, and um, the public opinion is very often shocked by some of the things which are said. Uh, but I think we have to be clear on that. On on, on my side, I'm not I'm not saying that everybody is uh, is clear and which, but I'm just saying that companies should not be blamed for everything we say, and government have to take the responsibility. I mean, I'm always amazed by the fact that. Talk about tax heavens. I mean, mm-hmm. we have been discussing for years and years and years how to stop tax heavens, how to destroy tax heavens, blah, blah, blah. Right. When you look at what is going on today, I mean, uh, there's been little progress done on that, and you have still uh, tax heavens living very well. So uh, I think there should be uh, an awareness in the various countries that uh, we have to make sure that we have maybe not a unified, but at least no huge differences in tax treatment, because this is going to lead, whether we like it or not, to tax optimization. So um, uh, maybe it's a little bit shocking what I'm saying for some people, but I'm not saying that all companies are clean. Some Sometimes they try to do things that have to be uh, uh, controlled, but I'm saying that the responsibility is also on countries and the governments who are competing on tax rates. I get your point. That's very important because the governments are fixing the taxes in their area to attract the business and uh, companies are aligning where they get the optimum return on uh, on their investments and uh, whether they can save on the taxes. Well, thank you, Mark. It has been very, very insightful. We'll take now a short break and we'll be back shortly. Get the news on our shows and other happenings by following us on Twitter. Find us at VoiceAmericaTRN or Twitter.com forward slash VoiceAmericaTRN. what's happening on the Voice America Talk Radio Network by keeping up with us on Twitter. You can find us at Voice America TRN.
Welcome back. Uh, you are listening to Global Business with Mahesh Joshi. And uh, with uh, me, I have Professor Mark Bertanish. And we are discussing about the uh, role of financing in global business. So, Mark, let's move to our next subject of discussion. Uh, please share with our listeners your views on how do you see the role and impact of uh, two upcoming economic joints, China and India, on global financing? You know, it's always difficult to uh, uh, forecast uh, the future, uh, but uh, in that case, I think there is uh, little risk of uh, saying that uh, given their size uh, and uh, given their development, China and India are going to play a key role in the future of the global economy. Um, um, why that? I mean, the size of these markets are huge. Uh, the uh, projects that have to be financed in these uh, uh, economies are uh, huge. And of course, this is not going to happen uh, from today to tomorrow. Uh, I think markets uh, in both places have to be uh, better organized, mm -hmm. probably. Uh, probably, uh, as I said earlier, better regulated, which doesn't mean over-regulated, but better regulated. Uh, we have seen in some of this market, I'm thinking about the Shanghai market, ups and downs, uh, tremendous speculation, uh, movement which are sometimes irrational. So this has to be uh, managed in order for this market to become uh, more efficient and more uh, related with the uh, fundamentals of, of the economy. But I have no doubt that this would, would happen. Uh, you see it by some tangible fact. You see it by the uh, the ranking of the stock exchange, for example. Uh, you see now uh, market like Hong Kong, of course, but Shanghai, uh, Delhi. Uh, this market uh, uh, going up and 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 coming to the uh, top uh, positions. Um, I have not the figures in mind, but I think if you are looking at uh, uh, the top uh, ten market cap in the world, yeah. I think in uh, let's say uh, 1990 or 1995, there was probably uh, eight American companies, uh, one Asian and right. one, uh, one uh, European. Uh, if you look at today, uh, we have probably six or seven, uh, maybe let's say five or six coming from, uh, from uh, 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 Asia. Right. Uh, and uh, the remaining coming from the US, and maybe one or two, I don't know, from, from Europe left. Right. Uh, so, I mean, things, things are changing. Uh, the, 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 the thing which is becoming important in these countries is the development of project financing. I mean, um, as you know, these countries are going to need, and this region are going to need a huge infrastructure project, which uh, would need... Uh, big uh, 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 financing, and we have seen already some of them working very, very well. I mean, I'm sometimes quoting the example of uh, uh, the two projects which have been delivered on time and uh, uh, on budget or in budget, and um, this is the metro of uh, Delhi yeah. and the metro of Bangalore which uh, are examples that uh, we uh, very often give in the classroom as a project delivered on time and on budget. Um, I think there will, there will be a room also in these countries for more and more, and we see that in reality for uh, private-public partnership, uh, which is probably one of the ways of uh, financing big projects by putting together uh, uh, investors which have different interests uh, uh, private investors having more financial interest and public investors having more some kind of uh, other uh, uh, non-financial interest but by putting them together we can uh, uh, find a good way of financing huge project so uh, 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 to summarize uh, that I think that there is no question in my mind that uh, China and India are going to be uh, on uh, uh, the top of uh, uh, the uh, financial markets in the future. Uh, um, China is already through Hong Kong. Uh, India is developing quite a lot too. Um, uh, this requires just some adjustment, 
some uh, better organization, better regulation, uh, better efficiencies of this market. Uh, I think the technology, as I said earlier, is there. It is more the legal and institutional environment which need to be uh, uh, to be reinforced. Uh, and uh, there is a huge need for uh, big financing in this in this in this uh, in this part of the world. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, that's very nicely explained, uh, Mark. Because as you rightly said, there are a lot of large projects coming in China now. India growing at more than seven percent in their GDP. And these projects will need financing. And for that financing to come in, all the foreign direct investment included, the market has to be regulated. What you're suggesting, it should not be controlled. It should be regulated. It should not be driven. It should be efficient market. Uh, the opportunity seems to be with the current forecast growing at both the places. Uh, Mark, we talked about China and India. Now, what do you see are the effects of globalization on international investments? Definitely China and India has a lot of these large projects. Yes, I think um, um as, as an investor today, um, I mean, uh, the globalization of the market is going to bring some very, very interesting element in uh, geographical diversification. It's really today a way to diversify your portfolio, uh, not only uh, on, in different industries, but in different parts of the world and in different uh, uh, countries. Uh, we have been talking about, about uh, China and India, but we should include also, of course, uh, South America. Right. We should also talk about Africa, yeah. which, uh, when it would have solved some of its uh, governance issue, will be a, a great market for the future uh, with uh, 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 fantastic uh, resources and fantastic opportunities. So uh, uh, the, the, there is, there is a, a, a great opportunities for international investment. Now, this being said, it might be a, a little bit, as we said earlier, difficult for an investor to understand what's going on in all markets and how different markets are going to be uh, changing through times and how the geopolitics, as we were saying before, are going to uh, evolve through time. So this is really a, 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 an example where uh, uh, we need uh, some uh, uh, professional advice. Uh, people who are going to be uh, looking at uh, uh, the country risk in the various countries where you invest, not only the economic risk, but the political risk and all these uh, potential uh, changes in these uh, societies. Uh, so uh, 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 to summarize that, for the, for, from an investment viewpoint, there, is a, there are a lot of opportunities, great opportunities of investing in various parts of the world, but at the same time, uh, 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 potential risk, of course, uh, and uh, the best way is uh, obviously to do it through uh, professional, uh, professional advice. There is one thing that uh, also this uh, uh, globalization is going to lead to, is that we are going to probably see in the future what I would call more truly multinational company. When you look at many multinational companies today, they are multinational in terms of their locations, in terms of their customers, in terms of their employees, but not so much in terms of their shareholders. They are still either American companies that are in the US or European companies in the firm from Europe or uh, Chinese companies that are in China. And I think we're going to see more and more company, and we're talking about this uh, cross uh, uh, invest cross-border investment and cross-border M&A, we are going to see more and more uh, uh, investment in uh, 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 come in the share uh, uh, in the shares of companies, so that companies m are going to become more multinational in terms of shareholdings, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, 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 their uh, equity. So I think it's a, it's a, it's something which is important too for the investor because it means also that uh, what uh, the investor is 
has a hard time to do, uh, companies can do that for them because they will diversify their ownership. They will be diversified in terms of ownership. So I think it's something that I see probably in the future having more uh, truly uh, international com multinational companies in terms of the uh, share ownership. Yeah, that's a very good point, Mark, you brought in because globalization has opened the whole world. And so you can ignore if you, there are sanctions on certain countries. Now you have the flexibility of doing business in any country you want to do. You can move cargo from one country to another country very easily. In the mechanism, the way the financing is working, you have ways to pay for it or charge for the goods and services, which in the industrial era was not as efficient. So maybe with the globalization has been supported by the digital economy mm -hmm. and many other things coming along with it. And the refining of the financing sector, which is allowing not only the trades of good, uh, otherwise we would have been doing just the barter system if there was no financing. Now we can pay with money and we can work across it. So thank you so much, Mark. We will take a short break and we'll be back shortly. Get the news on our shows and other happenings by following us on Twitter. Find us at VoiceAmericaTRN or Twitter.com forward slash VoiceAmericaTRN. what's happening on the Voice America Talk Radio Network by keeping up with us on Twitter. You can find us at Voice America TRN. Welcome back. Uh, you are listening to Global Business with Mahesh Joshi. And with me, I have uh, our guest, uh, Professor Mark Bertonish. And we are having a very interesting discussion about the role of financing in global business. Uh, we did talk about how it impacts the global business, how companies and countries look at it. So, um, what, what I think, Mark, is globalization has resulted in uh, greater interconnectedness among markets around the world and increased communication and awareness of business opportunities in far corners of the globe. Uh, more investors can access new investment opportunities and study new markets at a great distance than before. It could be done sitting anywhere on internet. Potential risks and profit opportunities are within easier reach to anybody and uh, it's because of the improved communications technology. Now, all these platforms, technology supporting the global business and facilitating easy investment, I won't say easy, uh, giving investment opportunities to individual investors like me. So, what should I, or individual investor, be careful about and where should they be investing in taking advantage of glo expanding an easier global business than ever before uh, beyond the companies and countries? Yeah, you, 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 you said it, uh, uh, Mahesh. You said more investors can access to uh, new investment opportunities uh, and the new markets at greater distance than before. Um, this is true. Opportunities are uh, becoming uh, uh, very, very, very big 
But at the same time, uh, we as investors cannot uh, uh, understand what's going on everywhere in the world, uh, uh, what opportunities are. So I think that it is uh, going to be a world where we, have, we will have to be more and more dependent upon uh, professionals or products which are already uh, uh, defined for us. I'm thinking about uh, ETF, about mutual funds, uh -huh. about uh, 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 products which are uh, designed uh, for investors who do not need to uh, uh, go into some analysis of what's going on in the country and all that. Uh, we have to realize that finance has become more and more complex. I mean, from the world where we had only shares on the one hand and uh, bonds on the other one, right. I mean, the product have been uh, diversified, uh, starting with the convertible bonds, the bond with warrants, and then we had all this uh, uh, derivatives market and so on. So uh, this is becoming a very complex world with very complex instruments. And, and therefore, I really believe that this is um, a, a, a world where we have to rely more and more on professional advice uh, if we want to be able to assess uh, what's going on in the world of investment. I don't, I don't see an individual being able to assess what's going to happen in uh, the textile business in Vietnam mm -hmm. or what's going to happen in uh, the building construction in North in South Korea. North Korea, it's not a problem. Right. In South Korea <laughs> uh, and so on. So uh, we, 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 we need to rely on a, a, a product which have been designed for investors, uh, mutual funds and uh, ETF and things like like that, so that uh, uh, investors have access to this globalization. Oh, that's fantastic. So basically, before we take the risk, although there's a great reward, let's check it. And mm -hmm. if sure. you don't know, take an advice. Sure. I think I'm going to do that. And uh, Mark, also, uh, you know, could that be the reason that the investments are going across the border, that the global financial assets market is north of $160 trillion. That's a large number. Oh, it's, it's a huge number. I mean, it's something without uh, using too many numbers, but it's probably 10 times the, uh, the GDP of, uh, of, of the US. Right. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's figures that uh, we have a hard time to understand. So it's huge. Yeah, and also, uh, if you look at just the global stock markets, uh, I think in 2013, it had gone about $65 trillion US dollars in 2013, a big number. A big number again. I mean, this is, uh, and, and this is showing also how small percentage move in these markets can create huge wealth or destroy, destroy huge wealth too. I mean, this uh, one or two percent or three percent move in the markets means a lot of either uh, money cre value creation or money, money destruction. You're right. Actually, a 1% move is uh, probably could be bigger than some countries' total GDP. Exactly. And also, uh, some reflections on over-the-counter derivatives market. It is now estimated to be around more than $680 trillion. This is huge too. And I would like to say a word about this derivative market. They have been highly criticized. Uh, I remember, uh, I think it's Warren Buffett who one day said that it is the weapon of, uh, mass, of financial massive destruction, or something like that. Uh, uh, derivative markets, uh, like uh, atomic energy, if I can make this comparison, can be the best or the worst, depending on how you use that. If you use these derivative markets as hedging instruments to really hedge against risk, manage risk, manage foreign exchange risk, manage interest rate risk, manage commodity price risk, this is good instrument. Now, if you use it in a kind of very speculative uh, word with a lot of leverage and things that you have seen in the past, mm -hmm. it can be, it can lead to some dangerous things. But we should not uh, 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 throw this uh, derivative market to the, to, 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 the, to the basket by saying they are useless. They, are, they have an economic role mm -hmm. and they are part of the risk management. Mm -hmm. that, that's a very nice uh, explanation for somebody like me. And uh, no, no wonder all of these activities, since they're happening, there is a very thriving global financial services sector. And um, way back in 2011, approximately the value was $11 trillion just for global financial services. Oh, yes. 
it's a big market and it's a, it's we have to remind it it's a big market for employment too for our uh, uh, young uh, young uh, people in our economies i mean uh, yeah. the, the finance is still uh, employing a lot of people and creating a lot of jobs Perfect. So, Mark, in closing, we are about to close the program. I would like to ask you a difficult question. <laughs> so, uh, the financial industry gets criticized. You know, it, it it's always gets a blame that it is the root cause of all the problems coming, and that creates a problem for everybody. You see, you see the recessions, a lot of other things coming in. What is what's your imagine perception of finance industry? I think finance industry is useful and will be more and more useful in the future. There has been a lot of criticism on, on finance, which I think is very often unfair. Uh, I'm not claiming that everybody's clean in finance. There are some people who have done bad things and they should be uh, uh, penalized, they should go to jail. But it is not because some sports people have been taking some drugs or because some games have been arranged that we, that we should say that sport is a terrible activity. It is the same for finance. Uh, that people have done things which uh, I am obviously not supporting and I'm heavily criticizing, but it is not for that that finance is essential. Finance is essential and it will be, as I said, more and more in the future. Why? Why? Because we are going to have a lot of issues to solve and finance will have to solve them. People are going, we have been said, to live longer and longer. We'll have to manage the retirement of these people. Who is going to do it? Finance is right. going to do it. We are going to have more and more huge infrastructure projects. We are going to go to maybe the green economy. Who is going to finance all these projects? So uh, uh, finance is still essential. What I found amazing, uh, Mahesh, and I have no answer to that, is that I say sometimes that finance is the only field that I know in which innovation is heavily criticized. Everywhere else, when we have innovation, people applaud. Say, this is great, you know, technically and all that. When we in finance invent a new product, people say, oh my God, what is this, this new product? It's going to uh, have the planet exploding or whatever. Finance needs innovation. Finance needs to solve problems and issues. And again, it is not because some people have done in the past bad things, and maybe in the future they will do again, that we have to say that the whole field is a, a terrible field. As I said, uh, uh, all the other fields uh, are, are bad people too. I mean, uh, in sports, in politics, in uh, everywhere. And, uh, uh, but it is, so finance is, uh, and, and I say that for the young people is a field where we need a lot of uh, 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 smart people, a lot of energy, a lot of ideas and a lot of innovation because there will be a lot of issues for which finance has something to bring. Uh, the architect is managing the space. Uh, the finance man is managing the time, transforming capital into revenues and income at some point of time or transforming income and revenue into capital at some other point of time. And that's what finance is doing. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. This is one of the best explanations I have ever heard. So I, I totally understand finance is an essential part of business, a country, an individual uh, for, for our day-to-day -day living. Well, Mark, thank you so much. It has been a very informative discussion today. I appreciate